So our next speaker is Dan Roden, who's the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Personalized Medicine in the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt University. Um, and he's going to talk about outcome data and links to electronic medical records. So, so uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is my introductory slide that has the little Vanderbilt logo down there in the corner. Well, I've done that. I've managed to take it away. I should get the real pointer. That's the Vanderbilt logo, but that's the only. That from, from now on, uh, I'm going to talk about Emerge. It was on a second ago. I'm going to talk about Emerge. Emerge comes in two flavors the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, uh, uh, a creation of NHGRI. We, uh, we've been part of it uh, along with Gale uh, since the beginning. These are the original five sites plus the sites that helped. Uh, manage the, the resource. And the, the original idea was just to, to try to understand whether uh, the marriage of DNA repositories to electronic medical records uh, was useful in genome science. I mean, I, I say that at the broadest sense. And, and, uh, and I, what I want to do is walk you through some of the results, some of what I think are the sort of high points and learning points from the results, and, and make the argument that uh, uh, that this is a robust kind of resource that should be considered for inclusion in any kind of uh, sequencing in the future. So um, one of the first things we did was each site got to, got to choose a phenotype of its choice and then uh, identify cases and controls from the electronic medical record. It sounds very simple. And one of the things we've learned since 2008, which is when we started to do this, is that, is that it's, it's not very simple. Um, this is the algorithm that was developed at Northwestern for type 2 diabetes cases. I'm not going to walk you through it just to show you that there's lots and lots of different arrows. And, and some of the arrows say things like, you know, greater than two dates, uh, is there an abnormal glucose or hemoglobin A1C? So things that have to be found and things that have to be found in time order. And um, uh, there's also a separate algorithm for uh, cases, for controls. So that, that, was, that, was, case, that was cases. This is controls, and, and again, a, a long series of algorithms, not just, the, not just the failure to mention the diagnosis, but somebody actually looking for the diagnosis and not finding it. And uh, uh, so that's how we did uh, diabetes. Um, and at the end of the day, we develop algorithms, deploy them in the electronic medical record until you find, say, 100 cases, and then some real human being goes through those 100 cases and says yes or no, and we develop a positive predictive value for the case definition or for the control definitions, and, and I put some of the high points on here. We generally do uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 uh, cases or controls for algorithm val validation. Um, I just show you this just to show you that the, it works. Each one of the five sites had a phenotype of interest. We proceeded to identify patients who had those phenotypes um, and, uh, and do genome-wide genotyping and genome-wide analysis. And one, one common thread was that each site got their phenotypes, got their genotypes, did their analysis, had nothing to show for it. And then each site went to all the other sites and said, oh, by the way, you genotype people for cataracts, but some of those cataract patients must have type 2 diabetes. Can you find them using, using the algorithm we've developed? And, and the answer was, in each case, or in, all, in four out of five cases, uh, we managed to find or replicate things that we had expected to find before. So this is a replication of the TCF7L2 hit in, in diabetes. I don't know, my, 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 time, my, my slides must be on a timer, but... I'll just leave it at that. So one of the things that we then did was we said, well, let's see if we can find, uh, do, some, do some work with phenotypes across the entire network. Uh, we settled, for reasons that I can't even remember, on the phenotype of hypothyroidism, and we developed algorithms, again, for cases and controls. These are shown here. Uh, and the idea was we would do them deploy the algorithms, and then uh, Terry was going to pay for extra genotyping for us to be able to do this, uh, this genome-wide association study. We actually deployed the algorithms and found that we had enough cases and controls without having to do any extra genotyping. Uh, so we spent the money on something else. But um, 
so, so in this particular case, the, uh, the phenotypes were validated at each site with a positive predictive value at each site. Notice the positive predictive values are not perfect. So at, at Mayo, for reasons that we still don't understand, the positive predictive value for the case definition is lower than at the other, at the other sites. But the, 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 uh, the case and control positive predictive values are pretty acceptable overall. Um, I, I, I need to mention that all these phenotype definitions are posted. And so the, your informatics guys can look at this website, FKB, and, uh, and go and uh, try to replicate those to find cases and controls in your electronic medical record. And, and I, I also should say that the, of the five uh, sites, of the five original sites, there are at least three different electronic medical record systems. There's Epic, there's a homegrown system, and then there's, I can't remember what else, but there are at least three different sites. So this is what the hypothyroidism genome-wide association study looks like. There's a, uh, a linkage, there's a, there's a, there's a peak uh, that replicates in a separate set. Uh, the closest uh, gene is FOXE1, and I just want you to remember this RS number because uh, it'll come back in one second. Um, and FOXE1 turns out to be a transcription factor that has been implicated in thyroid cancer, and so we think it's probably real, and some endocrinologist is going to have a field day with that, I suppose. Uh, so these are the phase one sites and the phase one phenotypes. Everybody got to do one phenotype that they designated in their original application. Everybody got to do secondary phenotypes, and then there were network-wide uh, efforts. Uh, I mentioned the hypothyroidism one. I want to say something about phenome-wide association study, FIWAS, which was actually our secondary uh, 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 phenotype. Phenotype's the wrong word. So before I say that, I wanted to say a word about hemochromatosis. I asked Gail if she was going to talk about this, and she wasn't, so I decided to. There's a paper in the New England Journal about five, four or five years ago looking at uh, the frequency of C282Y in HFE uh, in Northern Europeans, and it's a, it's a little under 1%, and, and most, of those, most of the males who carry, who are homozygotes, uh, don't have a phenotype, and very few of the women uh, have a phenotype, and, and the idea was that this is highly non-penetrant, and so you probably don't need to include this in routine testing. One of the questions we've been asking in eMERGE uh, is, suppose you had the genotypic data anyway, uh, what would you do with it? Which is a different question than going ahead and getting the genotypes anyway. So we looked in BioView, that happens to be our data set. Uh, Gail is organizing the effort around uh, all of eMERGE, and uh, out of 5,000 people who have genome-wide uh, genotyping, uh, that particular SNP happens to be on the platform we use, so there's about a 1% incidence of homozygotes. And the interesting thing is that some of them carry the diagnosis, many of them don't carry the diagnosis and probably don't have the diagnosis, but seven of them are receiving iron, which is the absolutely wrong treatment. And so our contention is that, that despite these data, if you happen to know and the question is, how do you happen to know? But in a genome-centric world, you might happen to know, uh, what would you do with the data? So we think that we can, we can certainly envision a day soon where people with this particular genotype, uh, their physicians will get little notices saying, you know, by the way, don't use iron, or by the way, look for X, or something like that. Um, now, the FIWAS is, is, this, is this approach that we've been hearing about for the last 16 hours or so of going from genotype back to phenotype. So you can uh, ask the question, in a, in a group of people who have genotypic data, who have been genotyped at a particular variant or across the genome, with what phenotype does that particular genetic variant that you're interested in uh, associate? This happens to be the SNP for in, in the FOXE1 region, and uh, when Josh Denny did a, a FIWAS, the, the, the phenotypes here are ICD-9 codes, so we would like very much to refine that phenotypic definition. But when that was done, uh, we replicated the hypothyroidism signal like gangbusters. You don't have to, there is a there penalty for multiple looks, Daniel, but it's, it's not like we're looking at 500,000 SNPs. We're only looking at 1,000 ICD-9 codes. So this is a pretty nice, robust signal. There's lots of other thyroid diagnoses. Graves' disease is not one of them, so we can say that there's no association with Graves' disease. I like the idea that there's an association with atrial arrhythmias as well, and uh, an association with an abnormal set of lab values. So, so we think this is a way of looking at uh, pleiotropy or looking at uh, genotypes, phenotypes associated with specific genotypes. This is another example. This is, happens to be a SNP that's associated with skin color, and when we do the FIWAS, uh, there's strong signals for 
skin cancer, and strong signals for other skin diseases. So we think that that's pretty important and, uh, and uh, will be a continuing part of the focus in the electronic medical record as we go forward with rarer and rarer variants, I think. So uh, in 2010, 2011, something like that, uh, Emerge expanded in to include two more, and if you were looking at the slide, actually three more uh, uh, adult sites, and we've now expanded to include uh, three more sites that focus on pediatrics. So it's a much larger data set. I'm, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read you all the things that we're focused on. We're not just focused on phenotype-genotype associations, but lots of interest in uh, finding new associations, lots of interest in this question of actionability, and I'll close with a little discussion about that, and lots of interest in the regulatory consent, privacy, CLIA, CAP kind of issues. Um, this is what the data set looks like as of this morning. This number keeps on getting bigger and bigger every time Gail gets on the, gets on the <laughs> internet, but it's somewhere over 300,000 subjects. And, and when I say genotype, genotyped on a platform, our definition of genotyped here is a platform that allows you to impute, so something dense, uh, a GWAS platform or perhaps a uh, metabochip or immunochip. So that's uh, a pretty dense data set. Um, I love this, so I want to talk a little bit about implementation because that's one of the things we thought about in Emerge and uh, in Emerge 2. This is a cartoon that came out when the first draft of the human genome was announced. Uh, this is what Dr. Collins said in the New England Journal of Medicine when he was, when he became NIH director, he, he said, you know, everyone's DNA sequence is already in their medical record and it's simply a click of the mouse. I have, I like the word simply because it's many things, that's not one of them. Um, and, and it should improve outcomes and reduce adverse events. So we, we all buy into that uh, vision. Um, the FDA has bought into that vision. There are 58 drugs that have FDA that have in their FDA labels some mention of variant uh, uh, responses due to pharmacogenomic, known pharmacogenomic variants. One of the uh, poster children for this effort is clopidogrel or Plavix, and uh, the FDA actually included a black box warning in, on, for clopidogrel in 2010 that includes this sentence, uh, consider alternative treatment or treatment strategies in patients identified as CYP2C19 poor metabolizers. So the CYP2C19 poor metabolizers are a group of people who have one or two copies of a variant allele called STAR2. Those incidence data are from a project that we're running at Vanderbilt right now. It's about, the denominator is about 7,000 Vanderbilt patients. So, so those are pretty accurate numbers. Um, but if you go to the exome variant server that Gail already introduced you to and look at CYP2C19, uh, it's a little bit more than STAR2. There are 67 missense or nonsense mutations, and a, and a third of them have never been seen before. So we think that as we think about implement, implementing, we can't just implement for the common variants. That might be the first baby step, but the next step will be to implement for common and rare. Uh, so I put this on, on the background of the slide that Eric already showed you. We, we have a proposal into uh, NHGRI to run a project called Emerge PGX Pharmacogenetics to start to think about how we, we would use sequence pharmacogenomic data in the electronic medical record environment. Um, it's an alliance with the Pharmacogenetics Research Network that uh, has a lot of efforts that involve thinking about what variants are important and actionable, uh, how you might go about putting them into an electronic medical record, and how you might go about building a platform that would interrogate pharmacogenetic very important genes. And, th and this is an effort that Debbie Nickerson is leading uh, for, ph for PGRN. And of course, Emerge, I've already told you about this part. And this part here is something that uh, the informatics teams at all the Emerge sites are, are very, very interested in. So, so it's a sort of marriage of convenience, but a convenient marriage of convenience. Uh, this is, uh, the, there are three aims, and I'm not going to walk you through them just to say that we're going to find patients, we're going to resequence them, and then when they're actionable, we're going to deposit things at the electronic medical record and do stuff around them. So we will tell physicians, your patient has a STAR2 variant in C2C19, you're about to prescribe Plavix, think about doing something else. And then we're going to find lots of other things. We're only interrogating 84 genes on this platform right now, but we're going to find lots of other things and we're going to put those into a repository and scratch our heads about them. So what we've, I feel like Emerge has been part of my life forever and ever and ever. It turns out it's probably only four years, but what we've learned is, um, is that uh, you can find cases and controls. Um, 
the complex phenotypes, so not just disease, but disease, drug, outcome of drug therapy, or disease, complication of disease, response to drug therapy, second to last slide. Um, uh, those are harder, but we're working on those right now. The, 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 the going from the genome back to the phenome is, is absolutely feasible, and, and I think that's going to be a gold mine. And it's a gold mine for the electronic medical record because these are people who have been ascertained because they come to a healthcare system. So you can say, well, they haven't been interrogated for every possible phenotype, but they've been interrogated for phenotypes that they or their doctors think for some reason are important. So, so this is an interesting approach, we think, and the implementation is, uh, can be done, but it's really, really complicated. And there's a great example of the devil being in, the, in all the details. So Terry had a series of 10 questions or 20 questions or seven questions, and these are some of the answers. I, I, many of them don't apply to this particular uh, thought process. So, the, so I think that uh, I would make an argument that, that whatever population we decide on uh, focusing for sequencing efforts should, in, should have as part of their phenotypic repertoire access to uh, sophisticated electronic medical records. Uh, there are big advantages of mining in the electronic records. Those are, those are real patients with real diseases, so that, that, that's one thing. We, we think there, there's feasibility demonstrated. Uh, uh, if you find things uh, and you're worried about how to find cases and controls, at least working in the electronic medical record environment allows you to start to think about how to implement. Um, the rare and extreme phenotypes, I think, should be accessible. Uh, we haven't tested that formally. And what I, what I mean by potential for coupling to other data sets, uh, we're continually being asked about tissue, we're continually being asked about serum, plasma, other sorts of data sets that you could envision interrogating in a large scale and then integrating with omic sets. And the, and the disadvantage is that the phenotype in the electronic medical record is what's in the electronic medical record. And, and people sometimes ask me, well, can't you get X or can't you get Y? <laughs> And one way to do that is to make the electronic medical record better. Another way to do that is recontact. And another way to do it is to say, well, for that particular phenotype, you need a different approach. If you want to study cystic fibrosis in gruesome detail, the electronic medical record may not be your best friend. It might be a friend, but it's not your best friend. And you have to go through the things that, that Mike has described for you. So those are the EMR thoughts for the day. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Actually, I want to Terry? make just a, just a quick announcement that we did manage to get you coffee for the afternoon. I realize we, we do have some we do have some European time folks here, so so there is some out there. But don't leave until you've you've been part of the discussion. So, so Dan, could you could you comment a bit on on the issue that the phenotypes are the things that are important to the patient and the and the clinician? I mean, it, it, it seems as though that's an important point that a lot of times we we miss, and yet we've always I think in in, in Traditional epidemiology sort of said, well, you know, that's only the ones that are picked up by the clinician has to be astute enough to notice them, and we may be missing a lot. No, no question. I mean, the, the, it's when people ask me questions about what it is in, that, that's good about the electronic medical record, I say it's, it's, it's what happens to people when they're actually encountering the healthcare system. And if, if, that's, if we want to sort of use genomics to change, to bend some kind of curve, I don't know which curve we're bending, to, uh, to, to make outcomes better, then uh, whatever, is it, whatever it is that people are going to see doctors for, or whatever it is doctors are diagnosing, is the starting position. Uh, do doctors make di mistakes in diagnoses? Yes. Do they, do they write things down in the electronic record incorrectly so that the algorithms don't work perfectly or so that we have trouble finding things? Absolutely. Um, uh, do they misdiagnose? Yes. Do they misdiagnose or miscode on purpose occasionally? Um, so there's all those, all those warts. But uh, I, I think like many other discussions, uh, if you have 300,000 patients, you can, uh, you have, perfect is the enemy of good, and, and nobody expects perfection from this resource to start with. So this is, uh, so I think that numbers are important, and we can get numbers out of this. Mm -mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It's wonderful to, it's very exciting work and uh, a terrific use of the resource, and, and I love the idea of the, the phenotype scan. Um, the one thing that we don't have if we just go to EMRs is time, time passing. So time passing, I'm sorry, the one thing we don't have is time passing. So if we want to know what really was the situation 10 years earlier, 
by and large we don't have it but you must have it sometime so it, how so, frequently so, are you able to get back to um, what you might call the source population whence come at the people in front of you so that you could do let's say your analogy to what Julie described so she looks now at people who have cancer of X she opens the freezer with what they put in 20 years ago What's the EMR equivalent, and how frequently are you able to do it? So I can answer that for, for our own site. Um, our electronic medical records started in 1991. It started to get populated in about the mid-90s. And, and since about 2000, uh, when I go to my weekly clinic, I don't hold a manila folder in my hand. I haven't held a manila folder in my hand for over a decade. Um, it, it doesn't sound, it's not, it's not 50 years worth of experience, obviously, but it turns out that when you're taking care of patients, you don't, you don't, you don't, you rarely go back more than a year or two or three. So, so when somebody's sample arrives in our DNA bank, and I'm not going to go through the details of how our bank is organized, but when we get a sample, it's attached to their electronic record, and that goes back to whenever it is they entered the system. We have about 145,000 samples right now, and our guess is, and it's, it's more than a guess, but it's, it's less than perfection, is that somewhere around half of those patients are patients who make their medical home at our place. We're a tertiary care facility, so there are people who touch the system and then go somewhere else. And then there are people who touch the system and stay in the system. And those are the people we're most interested in because they have the dense electronic records and they have the multiple outcomes and the multiple diseases over time. So I think that many of these resources are, are, are being built and over time they will be richer and richer sources of phenotype. Thank you. Gail, and then back here we had a hand. So yeah, okay. it, the, the group health data, the electronic medical records, yeah. actually go back to the 70s where the lab data rolled in and the pharmacy data shortly after, and there's decades of data, um, and our subjects happen to be age 50 and up, so we have long-term data on them. At group health they also get all their prescriptions there for free, so not only do we know what was prescribed to them, we actually know if they're using it and picking it up. And so we recently did an analysis of white blood count where I think we had on the average of 20 values per individual over time. And then we were able to analyze the median and actually analyze the longitudinal trend as well. So it's, you know, for, for an HMO in particular where you have that medication uh, data on top of the quantitative data can be very rich. Yes, we're actually NIH is funding um, a study in the, the Kaiser Permanente co cohort uh, in Northern California. We have a hundred thousand people and data that goes back twenty years on them with repeated measures. So similar analysis could be done. So everybody's design is different. So there, there are now, um, I guess, 10 sites or 11 sites, depending on how you count them, uh, in Emerge. Uh, ours is an opt-out model, controversial. I'm not, I don't want to waste a lot of time talking about that. Uh, uh, Gail had to go back and reconsent some of her patients because they had samples, but they hadn't been consented the right way. And uh, there's a project uh, at one of the sites that is doing opt-in at the time of clinic registration, and they, they guess that it takes something like an extra five minutes per encounter to recruit people. And I, I think that that's, um, I would love to know if that's, you know, what, wh how deeply the consent process is explained. But um, so, so we have all kinds of different models within the system. I'll just say that. Okay, there were, I, saw, I think, one or two hands in, yeah, uh huh. Uh, I, I just wanted to plead guilty to uh, over, overstating the dangers of the multiple testing problem. Um, <laughs> you're absolutely right. So I, th I think I think this, the issue will loom larger as we start collecting more longitudinal omics data. That mm -hmm. there will be many more phenotypic data points to analyse. But of course, Dan is right in the, in the context of being able to look at a single SNP over many different phenotypes. It's, the, the burden there is not strong, and, and you, sh you showed some great examples of how elegantly that, that can be used. Well, I showed the, the best examples. Of course. Oh, so those are the most typical examples. They, the, the, uh, the vision, of course, is to create a phenome that's not 1,000 entries, but 100,000 entries. Very, very precise microphenotypes, we call them. And, and, uh, and then we will get into the problem of, of multiple comparisons. But it's sort of, it's sort of like... 
a GWAS where if you get a single SNP that's up there, you pay less attention to a bunch of linked SNPs that, that make a signal. So a bunch of linked phenotypes that would make a signal is more compelling, like the hypothyroidism example, than a single one that happens to be hanging out up there by yeah, itself. I, that's a, it's a, a perfect analogy. The linkage works very well in that case. Yeah. Other comments, questions, discussion? Yeah, Eric. Yeah. And then whenever I hear the presentation on emergence, it's very impressive. But one of the things I worry about is these are typically rarefied environments. Is, is this going to be transportable out to to the larger population at large? And I won't quote you the number of uninsured and poor and those without access to health care in a state like Texas, but it's huge. Yeah. So um, the person on your left. Uh, has, uh, has driven an RFA process that, whose goal is to do exactly that, to take sites that are doing this kind of work, not, not, just, the kind of, not just the eMERGE kind of work, but genomic medicine broadly defined. I guess I should say the two people to your left. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and try to, to uh, embed those kinds of advanced technologies, advanced thinking into environments that are really resource poor. Uh, and uh, and so, so we'll see how that plays out, but th that's something that's uh, high on Terry and, and Eric's uh, wish list, and, and, I, and I think that's an obvious, I wouldn't say an obvious next step, but I mean, if you're going to push this nationwide, one of the things we've learned in Emerge, I think, is that what works at Vanderbilt actually does work at other academically minded places with a lot of informatics support. And the question is whether we can not recreate that informatics support, but actually recreate at least the the, the outcomes of those tools to embed in other places. And so, yes, we're trying, thinking very hard about how to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe. So v Vanderbilt must have uh, a cadre of outcomes researchers, comparative effectiveness researchers, and so forth. Uh, are, are they heavy users of this resource independently of the genomic data that it contains? Um, the, the resource is an interesting... Um, uh, interesting mix. There, the, the, we've created a de-identified version of the electronic medical record by itself that, that can be used as a resource for outcomes, for example, independent of, of genomics. So you can actually do work not in, in, a, in, a, in a resource that has a denominator of about 2 million as opposed to 140,000 or whatever. We, we wish we had more outcomes people, actually. Uh, the, major, the major users uh, tend to be translational scientists, basic scientists. Know, somebody who's studied gene X for the last 20 years and now wants to know if they're human phenotypes, which I, I find really a, a, an interesting and compelling use of the resource. And then, and then uh, people in the, in the Center for G Human Genetics Research who are obviously big, big, research, big, big users, we are looking at outcomes particularly with respect to this project of embedding genotypes in the, elect the actual electronic medical record and getting physicians to act on them. And uh, that's, gonna, that's a big long-term <coughs> I, I can't say I can't say more than that. We need more people to do informatics and outcomes like everyone else. Okay, and one last comment. Dan, is there any effort to link uh, families uh, through the electronic medical record to study phenomes across families? I, I, you know, I, certainly at our place. I mean, the only the only linkage to families that I know about is is when uh, you know, we do GWAS and then look at. Uh, relatedness across those sets, but we're looking to get rid of that. We're not looking to incorporate that. Um, and I, and I, but I think that uh, if if uh, if you want to use electronic medical records for the kinds of family studies that um, that we've heard about today and, and last night, um, I think that's a recontact issue in general. All right. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. So now we're going to move on. Um,